Okay, it's Dr. Gooden back with the second lecture for the trunk and spinal column module. And in this lecture, we are going to go over the joint movements. Uh, we typically combine some of the regions when we're talking about movement. So movement, I, I alluded to this earlier. When you see somebody's head move, you, we tend not to distinguish between capital movement and cervical movement. We usually, as anatomists, just refer to all of it as cervical movements, unless you're getting really specific. So as, as applied anatomists or in structural kinesiology, when you're diagnosing movement, um, whether it's for sport or in a physical therapy clinic or as an athletic trainer, uh, we're just going to tend to call it cervical movement. It's hard to distinguish between capital and cervical movements. And likewise, we often use lumbar motion terminology when describing movement of the thoracic and the lumbar region. We, we tend to just group it together because really they're all, they are all articulated together anyways. Now the next few slides go through the typical ranges of motion um, at each of these joints. Because we're not in person with this lecture, we can't get out a goniometer and actually measure your ranges of motion, but um, you know, I'll talk you through it and you can go ahead and go through these movements yourself. So in the cervical region, um, on average, we have about 45 degrees of flexion and extension. So equal flexion and extension. Flexion is your chin touching your chest, and extension is moving back to the midline, back to anatomical position, and then looking up to the sky past that. We can also laterally flex 45 degrees to each side, so that's bringing your ear to your shoulder without moving your shoulder. And rotate approximately 60 degrees. Any further rotation requires movement in the thoracic and the lumbar region. So lumbar spine and trunk movement. So this remember, this includes both the lumbar region in the thoracic region. And what these, um, what these various pictures are showing are um, ways you can measure the amount, the range of motion at the lumbar and thoracic region. So what we're doing here is we're essentially measuring uh, the distance between two points, C7 and S1, that you can easily palpate. And then uh, we're measuring that when somebody stands erect, and then when they bend over as far as they can, that distance lengthens, and then we compare the distance of those two. You can do that for flexion and extension. You can also have somebody lie down on a table, and we can measure this angle here. So we have approximately 80 degrees of flexion, much more flexion than extension, only about 20 to 30 degrees of extension. Unless you're a gymnast, then you probably have more. As far as rotation goes and, and lateral bending, we have about 35 degrees of lateral flexion at the lumbar and thoracic region and 45 degrees of rotation. Now, I've already mentioned that there is limited gliding motion between any two vertebrae at the articular facets, the superior and inferior articular facets. But that gliding motion, that small amount at each joint, adds up to a large range of motion over the entire spinal column. And I've also talked about how we tend to group the capital and cervical movements together under cervical, and the thoracic and lumbar movements together under lumbar. Um, another further clarification of the movement is that we, we, um, the spinal movement itself is often preceded by the name of the region. Okay, so if we want to talk about flexion of the trunk at the lumbar spine, we just call it lumbar flexion. Okay, so lumbar is the region, flexion is the movement, region and then movement. Extension of the neck is called cervical extension. And we want to be precise with our terminology. It's not neck extension, it's cervical extension. Um, another thing to note is that the pelvic girdle, which is included in the trunk, but we'll talk about that uh, musculature when we get to the hip and pelvic girdle, but the pelvic girdle technically belongs to the trunk and it rotates as a unit due to movement occurring at the joints above and below it, which are the hip joint and the lumbar spine. Okay, so um, I'll quickly draw out what I'm talking about, but future lectures in different modules will cover that in depth. So let's say we have a nice happy person right here. I don't know why I accidentally drew bangs on, on him. Maybe it's a girl. Maybe she has some bangs coming down. Nice hair and some bangs. I'm not good at drawing this. There you go. And let's say these are her hips there. I didn't really draw her spine with the normal uh, curves in it, did I? But if we're talking about movement of the pelvic girdle, and let's say we want to tip the pelvis anteriorly, so anterior pelvic rotation, so it will end up looking like this. Okay, it tips forward. Now, this has to be accomplished by lumbar extension, 
and hip flexion. If her, if her legs are to stay straight down underneath her and she wants to tip her pelvis forwards, essentially like kind of like sticking your butt backwards to try to touch the wall behind you or something, that's supposed to be an arrow. It's not a very good drawing, is it? Um, but this results in anterior pelvic tilt, but it's a result of lumbar extension. So I'll just write it out. Lumbar extension and hip flexion. And you can actually go ahead and do that while you're listening. Just stand up and extend your lumbar spine as you flex your hip, but keeping your feet firmly planted on the ground beneath you. And you'll want, you'll see how your pelvis rotates anteriorly. And if you want to do the opposite of that, so let's say that, let's say that this equals these two things together equal anterior pelvic rotation. But let's say you want to do the opposite. Let's say you want to do posterior pelvic rotation. And I'll just ask you the question, what two movements would you combine to create this? And if you answered lumbar flexion and hip extension, then you would be correct. These two things together lead to posterior pelvic rotation. So the pelvic girdle rotates as a unit due to the movement occurring at the hip and the lumbar spine. Okay, now wherever you are, you're seated, standing, in your living room, in the office, outside, um, I want you to go through these movements as we, as we talk about them um, because it helps you to ingrain it and to really to know it kinesthetically, not just in your head, but in your body. And I'll say this many times throughout the course, but your own body is going to be your best study guide when it comes to the exam or when it comes to putting this into practice in the clinic um, or with patients or clients or on the field or in the weight room. Okay, so spinal flexion. We have cervical and capital uh, flexion, which is bringing your chin down to your chest. And then we also, so that's up here, and then we also have lumbar flexion. So go ahead and go through lumbar flexion. Notice that there's also um, a fair amount of hip flexion going on. We can see the angle um, you know, of her hip decreasing there as well. Hard to differentiate those two. Oftentimes people have a disassociation of lumbar and hip movements, um, but we can, we can correct that usually. A good, a good coach can correct that. Spinal extension at the cervical and capital region as well as the lumbar region. Notice that um, extension is going to be coming back up from a flex position, hitting the anatomical position, and then you can go beyond it as well. All right, lateral flexion to the right or the left, bringing the ear down to the shoulder. But notice that reduction does not have a left or a right, okay? No left or right. Reduction just means going back toward the midline, back to neutral. And then we have spinal rotation to the left or to the right at the cervical region and at the lumbar region. Okay, one more thing to mention in this lecture before we get on to the next lecture talking about the specific muscles and their actions is that of core training. Um, and I want to say core with air quotes around it because oftentimes people think of the core and they think of the six pack. Or if you're like Dr. Gooden, who's post-collegiate, <laughs> it's, it's more like a keg these days. Um, there's a, still a six pack under there, but you have to dig to find it. So this idea of core training, um, it goes far beyond just training your rectus abdominis, as, as we'll see. The core musculature, uh, which is comprised of both large extrinsic as well as small intrinsic musculature, provides dynamic stability for your whole body, really. Okay, it's like the kinetic linkage between the upper and the lower body or probably more often your lower body to your upper body. And I say it in that order because if we think of somebody standing, okay, somebody standing on the ground, those ground reaction forces go from the ground and travel up your leg and then into your midsection and then into your limb if you're, say, throwing a ball. All right, and if you're wanting to, instead of throw a ball, if you're, let's say this guy's throwing, if instead of throwing a ball, you're wanting to, let's say, change directions, and I'm going to draw his foot way out here, like he's trying to change directions, and, well, maybe I'll draw him over here. Okay, maybe he's changing directions and going this way. All right, so now those forces are going up this way. And if he's changing directions, now those forces don't need to be transferred to a ball. They need to be transferred up into his midsection and then propel his body 
his entire body this direction. All right, so you can just see that these forces are starting from the ground. And the core is that kinetic linkage. It's the, it's the connection point, all right, that link between the upper and lower body. And if you're not transmitting force efficiently through your core musculature, then either injury or, at the very least, a drop in performance will occur. So we have these inner core muscles, these deeper muscles, that should be activating first to stabilize the trunk and pelvis. So these include the diaphragm, the transversus abdominis, the multifidi muscles, pelvic floor muscles. These are the muscles that help you hold your pee. You know which ones I'm talking about, right? When you're in class, it's gone for two hours, or maybe it's a two-hour test, and you really have to go. That's your pelvic floor that's keeping it in there and keeping you from embarrassing yourself. Activating these muscles requires a level of concentration. This is exactly why it's hard to focus on something when you have to use the restroom, because you're activating your pelvis floor. Now the outer core, this is, you know, these are the mus muscles that people usually think about when they do extra core work uh, after the training session, rectus abdominis, external obliques, internal obliques, and then erector spinae on the back. We can't forget that with back extensions, deadlifts, um, you know, stiff leg uh, deadlifts, etc. Okay, and that wraps it up for movements of the trunk and spinal column. Pretty straightforward, but we just want to remember to use appropriate terminology when we're talking about the movements and the regions that the movements are occurring in. And we also want to remember the importance of the linkage between the upper and the lower body um, as far as the core musculature goes. So the next lecture is going to look at specific muscles that create these joint movements. All right, thank you for watching.